much and good morning everybody from Western Canada. And I want to thank the organizers, of course, for so quickly managing to transfer this whole thing online seems to be going very well. So I want to talk briefly in my 10 minutes on the idea of links um, between cross-border dam induced migration and what international water law can uh, contribute to uh, resolving this uh, problematic uh, phenomenon that's uh, continuously growing. So this uh, phenomenon of dam induced migration straddles both developmental um, uh, migration, forced human migration, and environmental uh, forced human migration. This uh, migration often results from either dam projects designed to drive economic development, on the one hand, that's the developmental aspect, or as a response to changing uh, freshwater availability, for instance, due to climate change, that's the environmental aspect of it, or it's, uh, some instances from both. The main triggering factors of dam induced migration are way too complicated to get into uh, detail here. Uh, one of the main um, driving factors is food and water uh, security, or rather insecurity. Uh, these are in turn impacted as a result of uh, dam construction uh, through changes in downstream flows, spread of waterborne uh, diseases, reduction in fisheries, uh, deforestation, and so on and uh, so forth. The destructive effects of dam-induced migration often uh, result from the fact that the groups uh, who are benefiting or the communities who are benefiting from uh, dams, and there's no question that dams can be beneficial, are not uh, necessarily the, um, also the communities that are suffering um, from the uh, negative consequences of these dams. So there is an inequality um, between uh, these groups and who benefits from the dams and who suffers from the dams. Also, there's inadequate, uh, in some cases, resettlement plans, compensation plans by governments. Uh, so the number of dam-induced displaced people has been steadily growing since the 1950s. Uh, we did steady grow in the construction of dams around the world um, and promises to continue rising uh, with time. Uh, for instance, a study published back in 2000, so this is already 20 years ago, estimated between 40 and 80 million people that have already been displaced at that time in connection with large dam uh, projects. So I will say, uh, admittedly, that most dam-induced displacement is internal, meaning that those uh, displaced people tend to be within their home countries, uh, but just move around, sometimes from rural uh, to city. Uh, but displacement can also have cross-border cross -border impacts, and that's the aspect that I uh, like to focus on. And the idea is because uh, a lot of, or even most of, uh, freshwater uh, in the world is actually uh, shared by states, actually crosses uh, state boundaries, dams are inevitably being built also on transboundary freshwater uh, resources um, that are shared between two or more states. So these cross-border impacts of these dams uh, in terms of human, forced human migration, um, for, for instance, can displace uh, at one state building a dam on a shared freshwater uh, resource can cause displacements of people in another state sharing that same resource, or even uh, the displacement and movement of people from one state to another. So those are the phenomena that I'm uh, looking at. And so, of course, this uh, gets into the realm of international law, and there are several areas of international law that have uh, turned their attention to this uh, growing uh, problem, and uh, these include international human rights law, international development law, international refugee law, international migration law, international climate change law, so I'm, I'm far from being the first one to uh, think about this problem. But um, what I, the, the angle or the perspective that I take is uh, the one of international water law, also known as the law of international water courses to some. And in this regard, the idea is this is the body of law that governs generally states' rights and obligations in the general management of these international water courses that they share. And uh, within that general management also falls um, issues concerning transboundary uh, dam projects. So I examine um, the links, uh, if there are any, and if not, then I'd like to create some. Uh, between international water law principles and 
whether or how these principles can be used by these states sharing these uh, these uh, resources to minimize or uh, even hopefully eliminate the harmful consequences of cross-border damage uh, migration. So setting that out as a general uh, background, uh, just to review briefly, uh, the core principles of international water law uh, are three, really, uh, no significant harm, equitable and reasonable utilization, and the duty to cooperate. So these are interrelated uh, principles that are generally designed to ensure a beneficial reciprocal relationship between the states sharing uh, freshwater resources and promote their mutual interests, which unfortunately sometimes they lose sight of, but it is there to protect their respective populations, the water uh, resource itself, uh, and of course the broader uh, environment. These principles are uh, not new or not specific uh, to international water law. Uh, no significant harm is, of course, based on due diligence. Uh, there was a whole panel, if I'm not mistaken, yesterday about due diligence. So this is uh, obviously a big part of international law generally and international environmental law. Uh, equity in international law is also um, a long-standing principle and, of course, the duty to cooperate. So these are generally, they already exist in international, international law generally, but I'd like to explore, or I do explore in this, or try to in the, in the paper, uh, the specific application of these principles and how they can actually be used uh, beneficially to address the problem of damning use uh, migration as part of international water law uh, specifically. Because while they're general and global in nature, they are also sufficiently flexible, I would argue, to be adapted to regional, basin-specific uh, context, so they can permit states to design specific solutions to address dam-induced migration tailored to their uh, particular shared uh, freshwater resource. So just briefly to touch, uh, very briefly to touch on each of these uh, principles. So the first one is the no significant harm principle, generally requiring states to comply, oh wow, Three minutes. Uh, no, I'm talking real fast. Uh, but it generally requires a uh, principal um, state, sorry, to uh, comply with due diligence uh, standards of conduct designed to minimize uh, significant harm and that might result from uh, from a dam project, including harm to human lives and health. It balances the totality of harms versus the totality of benefits, including these uh, social uh, harms or benefits of a dam and. Um, perhaps more, most importantly, requires states to eliminate or compensate for uh, this harm that is resulted. So it can really uh, serve as a benchmark against which states can evaluate uh, dam projects and objectively assess from a distributional, hopefully, uh, perspective, uh, the harms and the benefits to determine whether the dam project should go ahead and how it should go ahead. And then uh, also to hold each other accountable for any resulting harm. Equitable, equitable and reasonable utilization very briefly um, sets out uh, some considerations, equitable and reasonable considerations. Uh, these are set out in the main um, the Convention of International Water Law. And so they also uh, inform this balancing of harms under the no significant harm principle and hopefully bring to light and, and, um, and uh, uh, enable states to consider these um, human effects, uh, including migration, that uh, these dams might have. And uh, the duty to cooperate uh, ultimately requires state, require states, uh, as the name suggests, to collaborate in the management generally and use of shared freshwater resources, and in the dam context, to create uh, concrete measures to, to enable collaboration, particularly uh, useful in the international water law context, the creation of joint institutions. So these joint institutions uh, can facilitate information exchange between the states, notification of planned measures such as dams, um, joint planning, etc. So all of these uh, put together, these principles in conclusion, uh, can guide the planning, the construction, the operation of dams on shared uh, freshwater resources, uh, encourage cross-border cooperation and accountability, and effectively settle disputes. Hopefully, uh, by doing all of that, prevent or at least alleviate some of the negative impacts of cross-border uh, damming use migration, and in this way, uh, supplement other areas of international law to provide a comprehensive solution to this uh, problem. Thank you so much.